what the science is showing us is the universe appears to be alive, it appears to be conscious. Near-death experiences are some of the strongest evidence we have that there is life after death. Peer-reviewed research shows that human consciousness can affect physical matter. As a group, when we do intention, we create a psychic internet. There is this universal divine force that guides all of us. There is actually a lot of scientific work showing how sound can heal. DMT is likely a portal to another dimension. Nature has a consciousness. That inner universe within us connects with the greater universe of the stars. New discoveries are now confirming what we find in some of our most ancient and cherished and spiritual traditions. Hello and welcome back. I, I really appreciate that intro in case I ever forget who I am. I just watch the intro and I say, I know him. <laughs> you know, it's weird to see your face on brochures and on a big TV screen. We were in Italy and they had uh, billboards on the road uh, in Italy. <laughs> Can't even talk about it. <laughs> it just chokes me up. And the producers, we were going to the venue and they were very, very proud to say, look out your window. Look out the window, Mr. Braden. And I look out the window and I think, damn. <laughs> That's the biggest me I've ever seen. <laughs> what I'm going to say, and my answer to this when I'm asked this in, in a conference, typically, I'm going to go back to a philosophy that's 2,000 years old. How many are familiar with the ancient Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S? -S -E -E Anybody heard of the Essenes? Anybody never heard of the Essenes? Thank you for your honesty. The Essenes are a mysterious sect. They showed up about 500 years before the time of Jesus. They are believed to be the scribes of the Dead Sea Scrolls, maybe not the authors. They wrote them. They're not sure that they originated them. Whole mystery around that. Um, Jesus of Nazareth was an Essene. Mary Magdalene was an Essene. They were of Essene traditions. In Egypt, the Essenes were noted because of their abilities to heal. And they were not called Essenes, they were called therapeutae because they knew how to heal. They knew about herbs, they knew about the body, they knew about breath, and they knew about diet. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and the Nag Hammadi Library were discovered in the 20th century, 1940s, the Dead Sea Scrolls were the oldest records of the Old Testament and the Torah known to exist. The Nag Hammadi Library is the oldest record of the New Testament, including the books that were excluded by the church in the fourth century. This is how we know they were excluded because they were found in the Nag Hammadi Library. Among those texts in the Vatican Library are a series of books that were written by the Essenes that were excluded from the biblical canon in the fourth century. Uh, among those books are direct teachings from the master, Jesus, to his students. So I'm gonna talk about Jesus not as a religious or a spiritual figure, but as a learned man, a very learned individual. The 18 missing years that are missing are not missing. They're missing because those books were taken away. In those 18 years, the man that we know as Jesus of Nazareth, he left Nazareth, he studied and mastered a number of spiritual traditions. When I'm in Tibet, they know him as Isa. He studied and mastered the Buddhist traditions. In Egypt, he studied and mastered the traditions of Osiris. And all of those were incorporated into his philosophy. And I'm saying this because it all boils down to the most beautiful and most simple and most common sense philosophy that has withstood the test of time that means just as much now as it did 2,000 years ago. And I'd like to share that with you. Okay, do you feel like you're looking at an ancient text? Yeah. Oh, me too. It's so mysterious. 
By the way, when we go to the Holy Land tours, we go to the place where the Essenes uh, lived and worked, and it, it truly is an amazing place. It's not, a, not available now, not possible, but we do. So here's from uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the Gospel of Peace. It's called the Essene Gospel of Peace. It was the, the copy of the book from the Vatican Library that was transcribed early in the 20th century. Jesus' students said, what should we eat? The master said to them, that which kills your food kills also your body. That which gives life to your food gives, also gives life to your body. Therefore, eat only that which gives life to your body. There you go. The things that destroy your food before it enters your body cannot be good for your body. It's not going to do your body any good. So what he's saying is the closer you can find your food to its natural source, not from a machine, not from a factory, not from something that's been mixed with other things and put into a package, but the closer you find your food to its natural state, more benefit, the more life that food will bring to your body. Now, after he states this, he goes on to elaborate tremendously, page after page. But this is, this is how he begins that sermon, that lecture. That which kills your food kills also your body. Think about that. When you cook with bad oils, when you put in additives, when you put in preservatives, in that food, they're not good for your body. But the things that give life to your food, the enzymes, the proteins, the nutrients that we're talking about, is going to give life to your body. It makes total sense. Eat simple, eat seldom, eat smaller portions, and eat only what comes from our Mother Earth, Father in Heaven's garden, what grows in the ground or walks on the earth. And that's my rule. Um, I, I'm not... Uh, when I'm in a plane at 40,000 feet above sea level, if, if that is not available, I will eat whatever is available. And the promise to my body is that when I land and get the opportunity to choose, I will choose that which gives life to my body. So it's not like I would starve myself. <laughs> and I'm not that rigid, but I am disciplined. I am a disciplined man. And I have to be, to be at my best for you and for myself. I want to be good for me as well. My promise, we talked about this in the green room, my promise is to be at my best when I'm here with you because your promise was to come here and be with me, to be focused, not have a million other things going on in the background. All that exists when I'm with you, I, I, don't, even, I don't even look at the days, the numbers of the days, all that exists is you and me in this time together right now. And that's why we're here. Does this make sense to you? Are you okay with this? Beautiful philosophy, isn't it? There are statements in some traditions that are attributed to Jesus that may not be Jesus. The Essene Gospels, I trust, I trust these because of the source. I knew the family of the man that transcribed these. In the, uh, he was a researcher in the Vatican researching something else. He came across these. The Vatican uh, didn't want them published. The whole story behind that, but it makes total sense. Cyclic aging is the constant replenishing a physiological regeneration. Do you feel like you have at least a better understanding of how to phys physiologically regenerate your body? Do you feel that? Do you have any tools to be able to do that? Yes. Pure human technology is what we're talking about. Do you, do you want to use AI and machines to prolong your life, or do you want to access pure human technology and transcend what the machines can do. Anything those machines can do for you, your body does better, and now you're beginning to understand this. How in the world did this mechanism come together? And it's layers upon layers upon layers of sophisticated, technologically advanced, soft technology. It's easy to build wires and chips. How do you build neurons and the chemical potentials across cell membranes for ion generators. I mean, you just go on and on. Stem cells, little packets of information that will give life to the organism all through the life of the organism. 
telomeres that are so intelligent, they know when to work and when not to. So they don't perpetuate the life of an unhealthy cell. You are such an amazing being. Now you know, you can take chemicals, you can take the wires, we can, we can do the transhumanism if we want, but we don't need to, all right? We've gone through all of these. I asked you a question earlier. We are the technology. We are the technology we've been waiting for. That transhumanism is just reminding us of who we are. So I asked you a question earlier, and I'm going to answer the question. You remember that man right there? <laughs> remember the good old days? <laughs> we thought things were, were tough then. How many people would like to go back to the good old days of earlier presidents? At least it was entertaining. We had entertaining presidents. This is President Bill Clinton. June 26, the year 2000, Bill Clinton did something that no president had ever done. And it's not what you think. <laughs> I, could, I could see that look. <laughs> he stood with a scientist at a podium and made an announcement that forever changed the way we would think about ourselves. He announced the completion of the Human Genome Project. However, at the same time, he also opened the door to one of the greatest disappointments and one of the deepest mysteries of science that has yet to be fully resolved. Because the Human Genome Project revealed a flaw in scientific thinking that scientists struggled with for a long time. Here's the flaw. First of all, what is the Human Genome Project? It was from 1990, 2008. This is the Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights. I'll just read it to you right here. The human genome underlies the fundamental unity of all members of the human family. They thought it would bring us together, as well as the recognition of their inherent dignity and diversity. In a symbolic sense, it is the heritage, the collective heritage of humankind. What an awesome project. There was a thinking in the science, and I was part of this because I was in the scientific community. Pre-genome, pre-2000, the thinking was this, that one gene in the body creates one protein. All right, for every protein in the body, we are made of proteins, it, it had to be one gene to, uh, to create that protein. So here's the problem. The human body has more than 100,000 proteins. So the scientists were like, frothing at the mouth in excitement. They said 100,000 proteins. That means we're gonna find 100,000 genes. We can patent every one of those. We can, we can now build drugs, 100,000 new drugs to address the problems of every one of those genes. We're home free. That's not what happened. Here's what happened. At one gene per protein, they expected at least 100,000 genes would be discovered, but look at this. The human genome only has about 24,000 genes. That's it. That's not an error of just a little bit. That is an error magnitudes off of what they expected. 24, we are such a complex form of life. For example, look at this. Here's a common mouse. Common mouse has 25,000 genes. It has more genes than we do, but we're more complex life. Look at this, a fly has 14,000 genes. Where's our genes? We're more complex. This is what scientists are saying. Where's ours? Where's our genes? 24,000 genes. Well, here, here is the mind blower. This is what happened. The answer is where we find our unique, pure human power. This is what sets you apart from all their forms of life. Because what I'm going to show you is possible you can do consciously on demand when you choose. Here it is right here, discovery number 23. What scientists found is this, that the genes are not static, they're not fixed, that human genes are plastic, they are dynamic, they shift in response to the environment. What that means, what that means is that one gene can program as many as 100 different proteins. It's not one gene per protein. One gene can program as many as a hundred different proteins. Think about that. That is epigenetics. 
because the programming, this is where we're going with this. This is why the 24,000 genes in the human body can produce 400,000, we've got over 400,000 proteins, all right? From 24,000 genes, this is why it's possible. Because those 24,000 genes can shift and change and program differently, and they can do it on the fly. They can do it on demand. It's not set in stone when you were born or when you're conceived in your mother's womb. You come into the world, it's what I call the factory preset. So in the factory of the mother's womb, our mother's womb, we have a certain number of genes that get us going. You are not locked into those genes. They change whether you're aware of it or not, and because they do, you can intervene and change them to an even greater degree. This is epigenetics. It's what Bruce found with the stem cells in his early research. But the epigenetics goes further than we have understood in the past. The new science of epigenetics, it says just that. It says that the genes are influenced. There are many different translations. I'm not gonna go into that detail. Many different, <clears throat> different translations. This takes us from the path of victims to masters. Can you see how that would be? If you get only what you get at conception, you are stuck with it. If you got good genes, Cool, if you got genes you're not happy with, too bad. But that's not the case. And that makes you a very, very powerful being. Not only do we have plasticity at the biological level with organs and glands, not only do we have plasticity at the genetic level with DNA and genes, we have neuroplasticity with neurons. It's all about our ability to change and adapt and now I'm gonna show you, this goes even one step further. We even have the ability to continue producing through what is called neurogenesis, new neurons until the last breath of your life in this world. Look at this. Used to believe neurons were fixed at birth, that you have X number, we talked about this earlier. And over the, the span of your life, you lose neurons through lifestyle choices and environment. Not true. Neurons <clears throat> form throughout the entire lifetime. From the journal Neuroscience, look at this announcement that was made. The adult brain does grow new neurons after all. And here's where they come from, and the way they found this was the scan. Remember the scan I showed you earlier today? Revealing new information about the human brain. So look at this, the new neurons, 19, 2019, right before COVID is when this was discovered. This is new, really new stuff not even two years old yet, published in the journal Scientific American, March of 19. So it's exact, it is now we're March, so it's two years old. The new neurons, they form in the hippocampus of the brain. And they are constantly, they're constantly emerging. Movement, exercise, stimulate this, nutrition, new thought patterns, all stimulate these neurons. We choose the gene programs. Discovery number 24, I asked you a question earlier. Is there a nutrient that transcends the limitations of all those other nutrients when it comes to longevity, to healing, to rejuvenation, to regeneration? <clears throat> and the answer is yes. And it's not a supplement you take in your mouth. It's an experience that's based in your heart. And that is where we're gonna go right now, okay? So for the rest of this segment and into the next segment, this is what I wanna talk about. Soon, some of you have seen me talk about this before. 1991, scientists discovered over 40,000 specialized cells in the human heart that were not expected. We talked about it yesterday and we actually accessed some of those cells. Those cells, sensory neurites, they think they learn, they remember, they feel, and they access heart intelligence independently of the cranial brain, completely separate, however, working with the cranial brain. Our soft technology, this is what we did not get to yesterday. We know that we have neurons in the brain, we know that we have neurons in the heart. You are the only form of life that has the ability to harmonize the neurons in the heart and the neurons in the brain into a single potent system. Two organs, one system. 
when you harmonize the heart and the brain, it's called coherence. The optimum coherence is a very low frequency. It's not even one hertz. It's 0.1 hertz. When you create the conditions in your body that allow 0.01 hertz, that is when you are at your best. Everything, everything is connected in your body. Now, I want to show you why this coherence is so important. We talked earlier about side effects with pharmaceuticals, side effects with nutrition, with anything. I want to show you why side effects are so important. That is the latest map of the interconnectivity of the metabolic functions in the human body. Can you read that map? Neither can anybody else. Because we are so complex. Look at how, from this, you can see why it's impossible to introduce a pharmaceutical into your body and not have that farm or a nutrient or a supplement. It's not just about drugs. Anything in your body that you introduce, it is going to influence other systems. If everything is connected, it means that when you create coherence between your heart and your brain, it's not limited to your heart and your brain. What else is influenced by the coherence? You tell me. Everything. This is the most powerful nutrient that you can give to your body. Because when you create coherence between the heart and the brain, and everything is connected the way it is, look at what happens. You directly awaken super longevity because that coherence relieves the stress that prevents the telomerase from doing its job. It allows the telomerase to become active, relieving that stress, all right? Stress that you know, stress that you don't know. Heart-brain harmony, super immune response. When I was working with the researchers at the Institute of Heart Math, we'll talk about them when we come back from our break, they sent saliva samples out to independent laboratories for evaluation after the participants had been trained to do what we're about to do in here today. The labs called the scientists and they said, what is this antibiotic that you guys are working with? We've never seen anything like this. The scientists said, there is no antibiotic. This is SIGA. It's the first line of response in the human body, the immune response. They said, uh, we're using the body's natural responses. And the researcher said, no way. They said, you, this can't happen. You're using a pharmaceutical. You just don't want to tell us what it is. It was more powerful than the antibiotics. SIGA is your first line of defense, the antibodies in your mouth. Heart-brain harmony stimulates that immune response. But if you want a strong immune system, this is the way to go. But it doesn't stop there. Direct access to heart intelligence. We did this yesterday. It triggers over 1,300 positive biochemical reactions. In the interest of time, I will not go through all 1,300, and you'll be glad that I don't. It doesn't stop there. Resilience. Resilience to change. Resilience is all about heart rate variability. We're going to talk about that when we come back from the break. If you want resilience to change, you have to have greater heart rate variability. You're going to create that for yourself in just a moment. Super intuition on demand. Super access to the subconscious on demand. If you're using affirmations to change your life, you've got to speak to your subconscious in a language it recognizes. You've got to communicate with the subconscious. Heart-brain coherence is a hotline to your subconscious with no hypnotism, with no altered states, a direct access to your subconscious. Super learning, super memory, we talked about this yesterday, super HRV, super cognition, and much, much more. <laughs> so you get the idea. This is one of the most powerful forms of self-regulation available to the human body. This is also the secret of some of the most ancient spiritual traditions, some of the most ancient occult traditions. They would, this is what they would do. They would learn to access their body, and what you do with the power from your body is determined by your values, where you are in your life. Just going through the process without doing anything else has passive benefits right here. Just from what, if you do nothing else, 
but three minutes of heart-brain coherence. The recorded benefits, you are automatically going to awaken telomeres. You're going to awaken the immune response. You're going to have, if you wanted that heart intelligence, you're going to trigger those 1,300 biochemical reactions, and you'll create greater heart rate variability just from doing what we're about to do. That is the nutrient, the most powerful nutrient. It's not a pill or a tablet. It's energy. It's a field. It's breath. It's emotion. It's focus. No other form of life can do what you're about to do. That is pure human technology. Nothing else is needed. And this is what we have the potential of losing if we give ourselves away to computer chips, to wires, to chemicals, where our neurons begin to atrophy, our biological potential begins to atrophy. But this transcends all of that. Common people around the world are doing the uncommon. I mean, it is literally the Netflix of spirituality.